Good evening. My name is Jason Wallace. I'm pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley, and we welcome you to another installment of the Ancient Paths. For the past while, we've been talking about what the Bible has to say about the return of Christ, and also how that compares with what a lot of the so-called prophecy experts say that the Bible says. What we've seen is that it's not just Harold Camping who has strange ideas about what the Bible teaches. You remember he had billboards up saying that Jesus was coming back May 21st and the Bible guaranteed it. There are a host of others out there that have confused people, that have been telling them all kinds of things, presenting uh, scriptures taken from all over the Bible and rattled off like a machine gun in a way that makes them sound like they must know the Bible better than anyone. And people go and they start trying to read the Bible for themselves and they're confused because it doesn't seem to line up with what these Bible teachers have been telling them. And they assume that they must be inadequate, that they must need some, some specially anointed teacher to help them understand God's Word. I hope that we have been seeing as we've been looking at what the Bible says about these things that that's not the case, that much of what is popular in evangelical Christianity today in terms of ideas about Christ's return, much of it is not biblical. The Bible is very straightforward. The wheat and the tares grow up together until the judgment. But we have Bible teachers who tell us that the church must fail, that things are going to get worse and worse, that essentially the tares are going to choke out the wheat to the extent that only a remnant is going to be left and then Christ is going to come and snatch them away. But that's not what's being portrayed in God's Word. It's only when you rip things out of context and make a crazy quilt of all these different passages out of context and ignore the clear teachings of Scripture elsewhere that you come up with these ideas. Dispensationalism originated in 1830, a significant date for a whole lot of teachings that are afflicting the modern church. We've been looking at dispensationalism and I started a study some time back of Revelation, just a survey. There's not enough time in, in this kind of format to really go through an in-depth study, but I wanted to do a survey so that people can have confidence. The book of Revelation should not be a scary book that is confusing and, and troubling to God's people. When we understand the context of the Old Testament, when we understand the language is taken right out of the rest of the scriptures, that it is, it is the conclusion of all that's gone before, we see that it is about the triumph of Christ, not just at the end of the, of the age, but all through history. Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 are the most quoted psalms in all, the, all of the New Testament, and they present a very different picture than dispensationalism does about the current reign of Christ. God in Psalm 2 laughs at the, unbelie at the ungodly who are plotting against him. And he says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Ask of me and I will give thee the nations uh, for thine inheritance and the, utter the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt rule them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And he gives instruction to the kings and the rulers, Be wise. Kiss the sun, lest, lest you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. 
Psalm 110 portrays Jesus not wringing his hands as Satan rules the earth, as so many people tell us today, but he is ruling and reigning at the right hand of, fa of the Father until all his enemies are made his footstool. It's a very optimistic picture. When Nebuchadnezzar has his dream about the, the image, it's in the time of that fourth empire, Rome, that that stone cut without hand smashes the feet of the, Im of the image and the whole image becomes like dust and it grows and fills the earth. People tell us, well, that, that can't be now. That has to be in some future millennium. And they completely ignore the, the, the blessings that the church of Jesus Christ has enjoyed over the last 2,000 years. We have gone from an upper room with a handful of scared disciples to where a third of the world gives at least lip service to the Lordship of Christ. Now, is there a great deal of, of hypocrisy and nominalism? Of course. But there is also a radical transformation that has taken place. It's not that the wheat are choking out the tares, but it is also not that the tares are choking out the wheat. The kingdom is growing. It does start like a mustard seed, and it grows into a tree. And there's optimism that we should have, like the generations of Christians before us have had optimism. But we have a host of people like Hal Lindsey telling us that we should be pessimistic. And they love to point out all the troubles that we're facing. This, this country is bankrupt financially. That's not me or even uh, some conspiracy nuts out there. That's according to the Dallas Federal Reserve Bulletin. That is the official publication of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. They said if you add up all our current assets and all our current liabilities and you, and you, you recognize the time value of money and you add them all up, all the different assets, all the different liabilities, all the unfunded liabilities for Social Security, Medicare, we're bankrupt. Our assets are not enough as a country to meet our current obligations. That's the reason we keep printing money. And they say, this must be the end of time. Countries have gone bankrupt all through history. Why are we different? Now, the reason I'm focusing on this so much is not because I like picking on Hal Lindsey and Pat Robertson and a host of others who have uh, set dates like Harold Camping did and have been wrong, not quite as notoriously wrong as Harold Camping was, but they've spent set specific dates that have been wrong. But they keep teaching the same system of theology that tells us the church must fail. We're in the Laodicean church age. Everything's going to get worse and worse, and you should actually stay out of, stay out of trying to be salt and light in the world around you. You just need to be grabbing off as many people off the sinking ship as you can. You don't have to really work, work at making disciples anymore, like the Great Commission says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever Christ has commanded. No, it's just converts now because we're in the last days. And they've been telling us that we're in the last days for 181 years. There's a problem. We've gone through the Old Testament. We've gone through much of the New Testament. Last week, to move into Revelation chapter 6, I began talking about the Olivet Discourse. This is in the days leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. He pronounces judgment on Jerusalem. We got a phone call last week as we were talking about this, about if I had time to talk about the fig tree. I didn't have time last week. But in Matthew 24, uh, verse 32, it says there, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. How Lindsay tells us, this is obviously the restoration of the nation of Israel. When it was reestablished in 1948, the prophetic clock started running. Until that didn't work out so well. Then it was 1967. The taking over of the old city, that's when the clock really started. And so we had a lot of people that they 
Hal Lindsey had said the world was going to end in thermonuclear war within 40 years or so of 1948, and that didn't pan out so well. So then some people began whispering, some not so whispering. Um, Jack Kelly, who was a local uh, dispensationalist teacher, he was telling people 2006, maybe 2007, based on the old city. We have such confusion out there. What you see in God's Word, I think, is very clear. What Hal Lindsey has to do is he takes the Olivet Discourse in Luke 21, and he recognizes it is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Because it talks there about not an abomination of desolation, but when you see armies surrounding Jerusalem, know that its, desol that its destruction is near. He talks, uh, Luke talks about Jerusalem being trodden underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. This is very clearly talking about 70 A.D. But then he switches over and tries to pit that same Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and say, that's not talking about 70 A.D., that's talking about the final judgment, or at least the judgment leading up to uh, the millennium. This is le all leading up to the rapture and the things like this and the thousand years that must follow. There's a problem. We're going to go through, and I appreciate your patience tonight. This is an unusual thing, but unfortunately, sometimes untangling the, the confusion that other people bring about takes focus. This is not exactly the format for something this detailed, but I appreciate your patience. I want to go through and look at Luke 21 and Matthew 24. How Lindsay and a host of other uh, self-appointed Bible teachers out there say that these are talking about two radically different things. Now, they may talk about double fulfillment. They may talk about uh, foreshadowing or something like that. But when it gets down to it, they're talking about two very different judgments, at least you know, but nearly 2,000 years apart. But I think when you actually look through, you see that Jesus is talking about the same event because in both cases, in Luke 21 and Matthew 24, Jesus says, this generation shall not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. Forty years later, in 70 A.D., the Roman armies under Titus come and destroy the temple. Not one stone's left on another. There is this huge slaughter. According to Josephus, 1.1 million Jews were slaughtered. And Josephus himself described it as the abomination of desolation revisited. The same thing that, same kind of abomination that had taken place under Antiochus Epiphanes 200 years earlier comes about again. He uses the exact same language Matthew does. The confusion they create is because they want to rebuild and redestroy the temple. They want to revisit so many of these judgments that have already happened, and they confuse it with the return of Christ. My hope is that when you see all these things and search them out in the scriptures for yourself, what you'll see is individually and corporately, we need to be ready because Christ comes when we don't expect it. I may never get up from this chair alive. You may never get up from wherever, whatever you're, wherever you're sitting or standing. Individually, our eschatology, our end times may be tonight. Corporately, they may be t as well. But how do we live in the meantime? We need to be faithful. And unfortunately, dispensationalism and the flip side, sort of a radical post-millennialism, um, not historic post-millennialism, but a, but a uh, sort of a bleary-eyed version of it, both of them can engender unfaithfulness here and now. Many people say that, that the old rules don't apply because we're in the, end, you know, we're in the last days. You don't have to make disciples. You don't make, pl make plans for the future. You don't, you don't try to do the things that are going to build a church for your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren because they're not going to be around. 
But like I said, they've been telling us this for 181 years. A good friend of mine, his wife, grew up in the Plymouth Brethren, which is where dispensationalism originated. Her parents were furious back in the 80s when they got married. Why would you get married when, when the time is so close? And then they had children. How dare they bring children into, into the age of the tribulation? They were furious. Of course, now those kids are adults, having their own children. You see, these doctrines matter. I mentioned last week a Russian girl. She listened to Harold Camping, and she thought he was... She thought he was faithful, and he was preaching God's Word. He took God's Word seriously, and he told her that May 21st was the, was the date. She listened to her, to her radio there in Russia, and he said that if you, weren't, if you weren't raptured up to meet God on May 21st, there was nothing to look forward to but destruction, earthquakes, Horrible, horrible things. And then you were going to be destroyed because there's no hell, according to Harold Camping anymore. He's, he really has gone like the Jehovah's Witnesses. May 21st rolls around. She's not raptured. So she kills herself. There are consequences to what we believe. There's consequences whether we are believing the truth or something made up by somebody who sounds good. I want to go through Luke 21 and Matthew 24. Remember how Lindsay and these others say these are two totally different judgments. Luke is talking only about 70 AD and Matthew was talking only about the second coming, or, well, the rapture and, the, and eventually the second coming. So let's look at these. We're going to do a snippet of... Luke followed by a snippet of Matthew. And see for yourself, there's, there's a few verses that uh, for, short, for, uh, for uh, brevity's sake, I don't have every single verse out of Matthew, but I'm happy to deal with them if you have any questions. But let's look at them. First of all, we have Luke 21, verses 5 through 6. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he, referring there to Jesus, said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come in which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. The parallel, Matthew 24. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that will, shall not be thrown down. You see the parallelism. Context in both. The temple must be destroyed. The temple they are looking at. Not some temple that's being referred to that's, that's after this one's been destroyed and after this one's been, you know, then it's going to be rebuilt and redestroyed. They're looking at it. They're pointing out the stones. They're pointing out the buildings. They're pointing out all these various gifts that... They're looking at a tangible building. And Jesus says, not one stone will be left upon another that will not be thrown down. Next verses, Luke 21, verses 7 and 8. And they ask him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be, and what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. Matthew 24, verses 3 through 5. And, he said, as, an, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. They're asking him, last time that the temple was destroyed, 
the Babylonians came and slaughtered the people of Jerusalem. And those that survived were taken off into exile for 70 years. So when are these things, what, what, when is this going to happen? They're asking him. And he warns them there's going to be false Christ. And we saw last week, Josephus talked about how there were all kinds of false prophets and false messiahs. People claiming that they were the Christ. Let's look at the next pairing. Next verses, Luke 21, verses 9 through 11. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. For these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. And then parallel Matthew 24, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So you've got wars and rumors of wars, nations rising against nations, famines, pestilences, earthquakes. And you've got them in Luke, and you've got them right there in Matthew. Same context, same order, same everything. But Hal Lindsey says, oh, no, 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 no. Luke 21, that's talking about Titus and the Romans destroying Jerusalem. That's the time of the Gentiles. Matthew, you have the, you have the, the budding of the fig tree. That's Israel coming back. We're going to press on and see the context of that. But these men say these things with such uh, conviction and they're able to rattle off all these various passages from a host of places. They sound convincing. We've gone through the, the implications of this kind of thinking, how it, how it undermines the church, undermines holiness, undermines a whole host of various things. And yes, sometimes it gets people serious for a while I mean, there were people who signed over their life savings to Harrow Camping to fund the, um, the billboards and the, and the RVs going across the country telling them the Bible guaranteed that May 21st was the date. Does that mean that we're not to criticize that? Because some people got stirred up? I think it makes a laughing stock out of the Church of Jesus Christ when, when these false teachers get up there and declare things that the Bible doesn't teach. They treat the Bible like it's some kind of puzzle rather than actually just reading what it says and dealing with the basic issues of who is God, who is man, what is sin, who is Jesus Christ, what is salvation. That's too bland, it seems, for so many teachers today. Instead, they want to have the great mysteries. I don't claim to have all the, uh, all of what the Bible says about Christ's return figured out. There, there are portions of Scripture, such as the man of sin, in Paul writing to the Thessalonians. I take comfort in the fact that Augustine, you know, one of the greatest teachers in the history of the Christian church, confessed freely. He said, honestly, I'm not sure what Paul, what Paul was talking about here. I can say that. What I can also say is that based on all the rest of Scripture, I know that it's not what the dispensationalists claim. There are a number of possibilities within the bounds of Scripture that I'm not prepared to say it must be thus and so. I may not can, can thoroughly define the 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 intricacies of the relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But I know that the Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong when they say that Jesus is not truly Almighty God, that He's only mighty, small-g God, 
and that he's really the Archangel Michael. I don't have an exhaustive knowledge of the truth, but I know what is, but I do have truth. And I know that that truth excludes a host of errors. And that's the clarity that I'm hoping to bring to you. But let's push on. So we've got wars and rumors of wars. We've got um, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. Both places. The very next verse is in both. Luke 21, verses 12 through 19. I'm, for brevity's sake, I'm going to um, skip a little bit of this. Um, but, before all these thi- but before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends, and some of you they shall put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. In your patience possess ye your souls. It's a little bit longer than that, but I'm not leaving out anything pertinent to the comparison. Parallel, Matthew 24, verses 9 and 10. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. There's persecution of the church. Now Luke is very specific about from whence that persecution comes. It's the synagogue. It is those Jews who refuse to believe and are persecuting the church, just like Luke reports all through the book of Acts. It's the unbelieving Jews who who follow Paul from Pisidian Antioch up to the area of the Galatians and stir the people up and have him stoned and left for dead. It's the Jews who are persecuting Paul and having him imprisoned who, uh, at the end of his third missionary journey, try to raise up a, a mob there in the temple saying he's brought Gentiles in and falsely accuse him. They plot his death. They make, they make vows that they're not going to eat or drink until they've killed him. Over and over we see that there, that there is a remnant that God has preserved, Paul amongst them. And Paul does first go to the synagogue. Paul calls the Jews at the end of the book of Acts. Even after all he's endured, he calls the Jews and preaches to them. And they're upset. And he said it was necessary that the gospel first come to you. But just like he had said at Pisidian, now it's going to go to the Gentiles. And they will hear it says in Acts 28. Blindness has happened in part to the Jews until the fullness of the Gentiles, he tells the Romans. He tells the Thessalonians that they've suffered many things at the hands of their countrymen as he has from the Jews who are contrary to all men and trying to prevent him from spreading the gospel. And he says that the wrath of God has come upon them to the uttermost. Jesus weeping outside Jerusalem. Talking about how they're going to throw a ramp up against the city and destroy her with her children inside. What happens when the people of the covenant break that covenant? What happens according to Deuteronomy 30 and Leviticus 26? What happens when the wicked husbandmen kill the son? What happens when they say, His blood be on us and on our children. Crucify Him. Hal Lindsey turns it all upside down. I've said this before. Unfortunately, I, I have to keep saying it. This is not justification to hate Jews. Apart from the grace of God, it, We would make the worst of them look good. My forefathers bowed down to wood and stone and corrupted themselves with every form of idol. But by the grace of God, Ephesians 2, I've been brought near through the blood of Christ. That middle wall of partition has been broken down. I'm a son of Abraham. The 
But this whole thing, they, they recognize that there's the time of the Gentiles in Luke 21, and there's this fig tree. It must mean Israel coming back, but it's not. Let's press on and we'll see why. So everything else is parallel to this point. Luke 21, verses 20 through 22. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And then the very next verses in Matthew's Gospel, When ye therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of the house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience and he uses the language of Daniel, this abomination of desolation. Daniel refers to it in context of Antiochus Epiphanes, the, the ruler of the Seleucid Empire out of Damascus. The Jews were under, they, uh, they were under his control. This, this, is what, this is one of the four empires that were left with the death of, of Alexander the Great. You have this division and in terms of Israel, the two parts of that empire that most mattered were the Ptolemies in Egypt and the Seleucids up in Damascus. And there, Israel's caught in between. Antiochus Epiphanes, who basically claimed to be divine, he was a tyrant. And the Jews were mistakenly informed that he had died. They celebrated. Antiochus was not dead. So he wanted to punish the Jews. So he goes into Jerusalem, he slaughters a bunch of uh, people there. Uh, the ones he didn't slaughter, he treated miserably. Uh, he uh, spread pig's blood all through the, the city and he sacrificed a pig on the temple of God in Jerusalem. He sacrificed a pig and rededicated the temple of Jehovah as a temple of Zeus. That's the abomination of desolation. I don't have time to get into all the details of it, but Josephus himself calls what happened in 70 AD an abomination of desolation. Luke is writing to a Gentile audience. They don't know, what, they don't know Daniel's prophecy. So he, he, he makes it very clear. He says, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, know that her desolation's near. So far, I hope you see that it's point for point lining up. There's nothing to indicate that we're looking at something radically different. That the whole context, the whole language, everything is the same. We're going to be drawing to a, a close of this section. I'm going to go ahead and open up the phone line so we can be getting some people lined up if you want to join in the conversation this evening. The phone number here is 801-973-8820. That's 801-973-TV20-8820. We're talking about the Olivet Dis Discourse and we're going to be comparing it to, to Revelation 6 because in Mark, well, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, you have the Olivet Discourse. John's Gospel doesn't have an Olivet Discourse. Ninety percent of the Gospel of John is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They cover the same uh, history, but whereas Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very close in their descriptions and content, they may use slightly different language and things like this. Uh, they're, they're doing things a bit differently, but the same basic material. John's Gospel, 90% different. John doesn't have a, an Olivet Discourse, but I believe that what you have in the book of Revelation is his all of that discourse, and we're going to see why as we press on. All right, so let's keep going. All of that discourse. Is this, like how Lindsay said, something radically different, or is it the same identical judgment? 
is Matthew also referring to, Luke, to AD 70? So that this whole thing about wars and rumors of wars and every little news report out of the Middle East merits some, somebody arguing that that's some fulfillment of Zechariah or this is some fulfillment of, of this or that or the other. Let's see. Luke 21, verses 23 through, through 24. But woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Parallel passage. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight not be in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Now we're going to talk about some of the language we talked about briefly last week. This is language straight out of the Old Testament. But the parallelism, it's, it's, it's point for point. What do we know about the siege of Jerusalem? Josephus says that just like in the previous sieges, they were eating the babies. They were literally eating their own children during the siege of the Romans. Jesus in Luke 23, verse 27, we're going to look at this again in a moment. Uh, we don't have to do the graphic on it, but basically he says, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. We're going to see that it's that generation. Now we're getting into the parts that a lot of people... Um, stumble on. We'll go to our calls in just a moment here. Luke 21, verses 25 through 27. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And then the parallel from Matthew, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I don't know that we have the graphics from last week, but um, this language of the coming of the Lord on a cloud, the sun being dark and the moon turned to blood, when we read this outside of the context of the rest of Scripture, it sounds like this must be the end of the world until we find out that God uses the exact same language of judgment, darkening the sun, rolling up the, 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 the skies as a scroll, the, sun, the, uh, the moon being turned to blood, stars falling from the heavens. He uses this exact same language of judgments that happened long before Jesus was ever born. Um, last week we saw Isaiah 13, verses 1 through 9. The, verse 1 is uh, for the context. It says, The burden against Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. This is a judgment on Babylon 600 years prior to Christ. Uh, Isaiah 19, verse 12, the burden against Egypt. Behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt. The idols of Egypt will totter at his presence, and the heart of Egypt will melt in its mist. I will set Egyptians against Egyptians. 
God's judgment on the Egyptians hundreds of years earlier is described as God coming on a cloud. Uh, there are others. Uh, we have um, Isaiah 34, 4 and following. And all the hosts of heaven will wear away and the sky will be rolled up like a scroll and all, all their hosts will also wither away as a leaf withers from the vine as one withers from the fig tree. Um, Amos uh, foretelling the, the uh, doom of Samaria. Remember, this is northern kingdom. This is uh, over 700 years prior to Christ. And it will come about in that day, declares the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. And Ezekiel, talking about a judgment, once again, Old Testament judgment on Egypt, Ezekiel 32, verses 7 and 8. And when I extinguish you, I will cover the heavens and darken their stars. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon shall not give its light. And all the shining lights in the heavens I will darken over you and will set darkness on your land, declares the Lord God. This language of, of sun being darkened, moon turned to blood, stars falling, skies rolled up as a scroll, all this, the Lord coming on a cloud, it is Old Testament language of judgment. There's a parallelism between the destruction of ungodly Babylon and Jerusalem, which is denounced in, Re in Revelation as that city that is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Jerusalem, the faithful city, has become a harlot, Isaiah said, even more so in Jesus' day, and so it is called Sodom. It's no longer the faithful city, it's Sodom and Egypt. And I believe Babylon is, is a name given to it as well. We're going to go ahead and take our first call. We have Mike from Draper. Mike, good to have you with us. <clears throat> uh, yeah, good evening. Uh, my question uh, would be, uh, is there any New Testament books that were written after the destruction of the temple, or are they all before? And that's it, and I'll hang up in this one. Thank you. Okay, sure. Uh, good question. One of the big questions on Revelation, we talked about it briefly when we started all this. A lot of your study Bibles and things like this will uh, automatically put it into the very end of the first century, around 95 or so. Um, almost entirely that is based on a statement by Irenaeus, who I think was basing it on Papias. Um, who is not exactly well thought of among the church fathers. Um, he had some goofy things to say. But um, he argues that it, that it appeared in um, the reign of, um, my mind's just gone tonight, what is it, Tiberius, I think. Um, so roughly 95 AD. I don't think that's overwhelming evidence. I think the internal evidence uh, no one, no one really argues, in the evangelical camp at least, for late dates on any other books. Um, you have some of the liberals who try to claim that Matthew's written much later and things like this. Uh, early church said no, actually. The consensus in the early church is Matthew was written before Mark, which flies in the face of what a lot of so-called scholars try to say today. But um, the only question is whether Revelation was written after the time. I think everything else clearly fits prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. The internal evidence, um, we're told that um, it is Rome uh, that, that's being described. I mean, it's, it's clearly talking about Rome. Um, we have um, the rulers, there's um, the seven heads, uh, five are no more, um, one is and one will yet be for a little while. I forget the, I, I, I covered this in more depth then. Points to the time of Nero. Also, we're told to go and measure the temple. Well, if it's written in 95 AD, there is no more temple. The temple's been destroyed. So the internal evidence, uh, how closely Revelation parallels the Olivet Discourse, all the context is there. It's, it's, it's talking about destruction of Jerusalem. And 
I don't see how you can place it after 70 AD very easily. So uh, there's a whole book before Jerusalem fell um, that deals with the dating of Revelation. But I don't know of anyone who questions anything other than Revelation. But by dating Revelation after 70 AD, a lot of people are then are able to dismiss that it's talking about the same time period that the rest of the Olivet Discourse is. We're going to go to Roland from Provo. Roland, good to have you with us this evening. Roland? You're on the air. Yeah. Uh, Jason, uh, I, uh, I cook. can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, uh, uh, I, I don't understand how you, uh, how you relate uh, Matthew 24 with events before before uh, the coming of Christ because on, on verse in verse uh, 36 verse 26 in Matthew 24 says uh, but that of the day and the uh, and hour knoweth no man no not the angel of heaven but my father in heaven only then later in the in the first 44 it says therefore be you also ready for a, such an hour as you think not the son of man cometh so how can you relate that of events of before 70 AD? Because of what immediately followed. If you want to answer that. <laughs> yes, th thank you for calling. It's a good question. In Matthew's Gospel, I believe you have this contrast between the, you have uh, two, two basic questions being asked. And there's a contrast there. Um, that there's a, there is this final judgment that's also being looked forward to. But the thing that you're missing, Rowan, is verse 34. Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. In fact, let's, let's look at our, um, uh, our next comparison. Um, Luke 21, verses 29 through 32. We've got a graphic on this. Speaking of Jesus, it says, And he spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees, when they uh, now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now, uh, nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. This is Luke's account. Okay? There's this contrast between him coming at a day and hour knows no man and looking for these signs. The confusion is the context of everything prior to verse 34 in Matthew. Matthew, I'll read that, verses 32 and 34, or 32 through 34. Jesus says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see the, all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Um, this is the cutoff. Everything that has gone before is going to be fulfilled. Uh, we don't have time in, in, in the brief time we have tonight to go through all the various um, specifics about in Matthew you have the sending out of the angels to gather the elect. Uh, it's, a, it's a fulfillment of Deuteronomy and it's contrasting the, the Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered your children together. Literally the, the word is synagogue it's a, or a, the verbal form of synagogue. Now the gospel is going to go out to the whole world. And he's going to bring, he's going to go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in. The bride is going to, to, to be made up from every nation, tribe, and tongue. The harlots being cast out. The second coming comes when we don't know. It may be now. Five, well, it wasn't then. Maybe five minutes from now. It may be 500 years from now. My frustration is these people set up these events and get people looking for things that have already been fulfilled. They fail to, to recognize 
that Christ is on his throne and he is reigning until all his enemies are made his footstool. You don't have to... I, I hear people all the time, they're, they're worried. There are evil people in the world and they're doing evil things and they're getting together and they're, they're talking about doing big evil things. Well, be. God laughs at them. Psalm 2. God laughs at them. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. He's going he's to break the nations like a potter's vessel. Imagine an iron rod meeting a clay pot. So many people, there, there, are, there are much better forms of dispensationalism. Not every dispensationalist teaches the same thing, thankfully. But much of what people have been fed for the last 50, 70 years here in America has been dispensationalism. Most, most people don't have a clue that it's novel. So many people here in Utah, they don't have a concept of any history outside of, of Mormon history much at all. Their, their, their view of Christian history is basically the Manti uh, pageant where you know, everybody's stupid and, and nuts except for the Mormons. But at least they know that it actually has a history a lot of dispensationalists, they, they just assume that it goes back to the apostles because they've got no concept at all. The message of Revelation is Jesus wins. And I want to press on a little bit, just in the little bit of time we have left. In Luke 23, we have this warning. And it is... Um, Jesus is on his way to the cross. Simon of Cyrene has been given the cross because Jesus can't carry it. And we're told there, Luke 23, verse 27 and following, And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? When you go through Matthew, excuse me, when you go through Revelation chapter 6, you have this wonderful parallel to what we see in the Olivet Discourse. You have war. Conquest, famines, uh, you have persecution of the saints, you have the sun being darkened, the moon turned to blood, stars falling from the heavens. And you have this at the very end. Revelation chapter 6. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains uh, and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who is able to stand? Sound familiar? Be crying to the mountains to fall on us. Why? To hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. Jesus wins. Jesus comes humble and meek. He comes not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He gets down and washes the feet of his disciples. But make no mistake, you're dealing with God. And Revelation is not just a revelation about what's to come. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That He is the Lamb that was slain and He is also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And in Revelation, no more is He coming on a colt, a foal of an ass. He is now coming 
on a charger for war. And the sword is going out and destroying his enemies. And he's being worshipped. And all glory and honor is given to him. I, I, there are people who go crazy looking for the kingdom here and now and power here and now. And they're often set up as, as the straw man against which everyone can react. But much of what I hear from Christians is this whiny pessimism. We serve a mighty Savior. We serve one who laughs at his enemies and one who will build his church in spite of all the opposition and the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. So what do we do? We prepare for the future. When, when, we, when Christ comes back, we want to be found doing what he has given us to do. We want to be trusting in him and we want to see the foundations for a church for our children and our grandchildren, however, however many generations the Lord may give us. Not many years, my, my, my eschatology's up. Maybe not even years. But do we plan for a future? Or do we let these Bible teachers lead us off into self-indulgence? That's a question. Well, we're trying to move on through our survey of Revelation 6. This has been something that we had to lay the foundations. I appreciate your patience this evening. This show is sponsored by Christ Presbyterian Church. I am the pastor. We are a congregation of the Orthodox Presbyterian denomination. We believe the Bible is God's Word, our only infallible rule of faith and practice. We worship Sunday mornings at 11 a.m., Sunday evenings at 5.30 p.m. We stress simple, reverent, God-honoring worship, expository preaching. We meet at 11 a.m., 5.30 p.m. at 8630 West, 2700 South here in the Salt Lake Valley. That's Main Street Magna. We have a sister congregation, Berean, Presbyterian meets at 9 a.m. at 3350 Harrison Boulevard, and we're organizing Bible studies in Heber and Utah County. If you have any questions, you can contact us at 801-969-7948. Till next time, we wish you the Lord's greatest blessings. Good night. Heal, heal us,